It was kind of exciting last night. A lot of uh, the uh, word that I got was it was too short. And so tonight we're going to go four hours. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but uh, it was good. We enjoyed that time of fellowship, uh, talking with the missionaries, tasting the, uh, the samples and stuff like that. And, and it was a pretty good voyage, pretty good cruise last night. And so I hope you enjoyed that. And we're thankful to have each of our missionaries here tonight. And I uh, want to mention a couple things. Our faith promise, if you haven't filled that out yet, pray about what the Lord would have you do. Put that in the offering plate tonight. We want to see this go up. Um, it'd be great to see that doubled uh, tonight. And then by Wednesday night, tripled. And no, <laughs> at least it would be nice to get up there a little higher than a little over 20,000, maybe we can hit that 30,000 tonight, I don't know. But uh, pray about what the Lord would have you give towards missions in that. Let's open in a word of prayer, and then we're going to sing a song, all right? Father, thank you for the privilege to be here tonight. Pray that you do a mighty work on our behalf. Pray that you bless Brother Todd as he preaches, use him in a mighty way. I pray for Brother Bob as he presents the work that's going on in Ivory Coast, we're thankful for their, their work there. And uh, each aspect of tonight, you'd be honored and glorified. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for our first song. We're going to do our theme song. And Justin's going to come lead us. Number 643 in your hymn book. 643. We'll sing this through twice. Let me see the world through the eyes of Jesus. What a prayer. Amen. Let me see the world through the eyes of Jesus. Let me hear the cries of the people lost in sin. Let me feel the touch of the hurting reaching out for hope. Let me see the world through the eyes of Christ. Once more, let me see the world through the eyes of Jesus. Let me hear the cries of the people lost in sin. Let me feel the touch of the hurting reaching out for hope. Let me see the world through the eyes of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to ask the men to get ready. We're going to take our offering up right away. If you want to quote the verse with me, I forgot it was up here, so that's like a cheating. I asked you to turn your Bibles that first time to Matthew 4, 19, but uh, you've got it right up here. It says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That ought to be our desire, to be reaching the lost with the world, the world around us that's lost. Come on forward, men. Let's repeat this verse together. You can see it up here. All right, it's found in Matthew 4, 19. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Steve, do you mind praying for the offering, please? Lord, we thank you for the privilege, Father, to be a part of missions and to have our missionaries here. We pray for the lost all around the world. Lord, we pray for those uh, missionaries that are here tonight. Lord, for those that you call them to that are missing their people. I pray in their absence, Lord, for the, those you call to be in their place to support their work. Pray you bless them. Pray for souls to continue to be saved and thy disciples made. I pray for our offering tonight, Lord, that it would go down to the glory of God for the souls of lost. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
thank you. We're going to ask Bob to come up, and we're going to, he's going to do a presentation at this time. We'll lower the lights, if we could, please. Okay, thank you very much for your prayers and support over these past few years. Uh, we have been in Ivory Coast now for 19 years, going on 20, looking to go back uh, December 7th, uh, back to the field. Uh, I just wanted to give you a, a summary of the kinds of things that, that are going on in uh, the, the Fundamental Baptist Church of Aniyama, which is uh, uh, near the big city of Abidjan. It's the northernmost suburb of the big city of Abidjan. So after us, it's, uh, it's the countryside. And uh, so we've had a burden to plant churches in the, in the, uh, in the villages uh, that are in the forests to the north of uh, the city of Aniyama. <clears throat> We're able to see those churches started because, because uh, people from the villages come into town and uh, some of them came to get jobs in town, and we were able to lead some of those people to the Lord and then go back to their villages and evangelize uh, the people uh, there. So that's how these churches get, get going, and we're, we're glad for what the Lord has done uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to establish a gospel witness in these places. So let me just uh, share the share the, uh, the presentation with you. Okay. Ivory Coast is in West Africa. That's the part of Africa that sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean. The big city of Abidjan is a, is a hub for uh, what used to be French West Africa. Uh, Abidjan is called the Paris of Africa because it's so highly developed. France is the primary trading partner of, uh, of the Ivory Coast. But there are many Muslims who live in Ivory Coast. They've come down from the north, and uh, probably 35 to 40 percent of the country is now Muslim, and they do have a Muslim president, and many people in the administration are Muslims. We live in the town of Aniyama, which is probably about 60 to 80,000 people uh, spread out over several hills. Uh, we live on the, the edge of the city in this three-bedroom house. Some of our neighbors, uh, this is Sylvie, who is a member of our church. Uh, she lives right down the street, along with her kids. She has a Muslim husband, but he permits everybody to come to church, and we have a good relationship with him. The kids come over every, just about every day, and my wife has helped them with schoolwork, and she's, uh, she's taught the two older ones piano, and so they're, they're, uh, they have some potential. And we're grateful for uh, the older girl, Azalisa. She's uh, very helpful at the house, and she types a lot of my Sunday school lessons for me. They are, they are all members of the Fundamental Baptist Church of Aniyama, which was planted by Missionary Tom Vineyard in 1994. Uh, pastor Max Ake, who has been pastor of the church since 2006, when the church became uh, independent, shown here with with his wife and one of their three children. And assistant pastor John Luke and his wife Vivian. John Luke is my assistant and he is in charge of the, uh, of the church planting efforts in the villages north of town. And Vivian uh, works in the deaf ministry of the Aniyama Church. Here's one of our young men in, in the Aniyama Church. His name is DeRoche. He's taken Bible Institute classes. He's a uh, a good soul winner. He's, uh, he does uh, several Saturday Bible clubs, and uh, uh, he's, uh, he has a lot of potential for serving the Lord. My wife uh, works in the Aniyama Church as a uh, translator for the deaf. She learned that skill after, she, after we got to the field. And uh, the deaf ministry was led by the pastor's wife, and they've they have about 30 to 40 people in the deaf ministry, and a school has been started, a primary school for the deaf. Now, most of these uh, deaf people come from Muslim families because the Muslims don't know what to do with their deaf children. So they let them, let them come here, and 
we were able to uh, give them the gospel and see many of them saved, including these two, Delphan and Genevieve on the right, are both deaf. They were married several years ago <clears throat> in the Antioch Church, and uh, Delphan has become the pastor, the deaf pastor for the people, uh, for, the, for the people in the church. <clears throat> Excuse me. On Sundays, Pastor John Luke and my wife and I, and sometimes other people, go out to the villages. Uh, out north of town, it's a place where there's no running water, so people go down to the creek, and that's where they wash their clothes, that's where they get water to wash their dishes. Uh, this church uh, was started in 2000, 2006. Uh, in 2010, we were asked to take it over because the National Missionary left the country and went to uh, Burkina Faso. And so John Luke and I took it over. It was meeting in this borrowed building. We would teach the kids on the, uh, on the outside and under the lean-to, and John Luke would preach to the adults inside. The church uh, grew, and we were able to see a number of people added uh, through the years. And so they needed to have a new building. So we bought a piece of land uh, not too far away, and got out the picks and shovels and dug the foundation. We had the, the members of the church, the kids, the girls, the boys, uh, bring sand and gravel from the creeks. It takes a lot of sand and gravel to make, to make a building. And put up the walls, hired masons to do that. Uh, and eventually we're able to have a, a building that is uh, uh, of good size and able to hold uh, uh, sometimes uh, up to 100 people. So this is the auditorium, and this is a room for the, for the children's ministries. Uh, we've seen a, a number of the kids get saved and receive Bibles. This is Michelle, uh, just a real little treasure, and we're glad for her faithfulness, as well as her, her two brothers, uh, who are also uh, faithful members of the church. We've been able to see people baptized each year. And here's John Luke baptizing uh, three people, uh, Lucien, uh, uh, Edward, and Daniel in the creek. Uh, the Irfa Church uh, has a, a young man who is very skilled in music, and he's been able to develop a children's choir, as which sings at special occasions. And their love of music uh, led us to... Uh, Accept the invitation of, uh, of Mark and Ariel Gilmore, who are from Falls Baptist Church, who came to visit us this past, uh, this past summer. And they conducted a music seminar for the kids at Irfa and the other village churches, sent people also to learn about uh, godly principles in music. Uh, summertime means that we have uh, a time for vacation Bible school and for camp. Uh, in 2020, because of COVID, we did not have a camp, but we did have Vacation Bible School in each of the village churches uh, at Irfa. We had skits and preaching and uh, lots of good times. Saw several people saved, and uh, uh, the, the ladies mobilized to cook. She's cooking uh, rice over an open fire for 140 people, <laughs> and everybody got something to eat. And this is a little girl from the, another village church, the village of Abbe. Her name is Danielle, and she trusted Christ during that vacation Bible school. The Abbe church, where Danielle is from, uh, has a Bible club. It was uh, also started and, uh, uh, by the national missionary who went to Burkina Faso. And John Luke and I have uh, uh, taken it over in the past couple of years. Uh, it, it, it was kind of run down. This was a building that was built out of mud that the missionary built with his own hands. So we've been conducting Wednesday Bible clubs and built it up to about 30 to 40 kids coming on Wednesday and many coming on Sunday. Uh, they hear a Bible story, they get a page to color, and uh, they enjoy it very much. There are three young ladies that help uh, with a Wednesday Bible club. Pascaline, Flora in the middle, and Martine, and I'm grateful for their help. Flora also teaches uh, Sunday school uh, to the kids. She's, uh, uh, she's uh, 
She's a girl that has uh, five younger brothers and sisters, and she knows how to take care of younger children. The church has grown, and so we've, we needed to build a building. So we laid out the foundation and uh, discovered that after we put in the foundation, it was going to take about eight truckloads of dirt in order to fill, that, fill this in. So we hired a man with a caterpillar to come and, uh, and, to, and to move dirt from, the, from elsewhere on the lot to, to, the, to the foundation. But he stood us up. So we had 25 to 30 kids from the Aniyama Church and from the other village churches come. And they mobilized with pick and shovel and basins and buckets. And uh, it took three days, but they were able to fill in that whole foundation. And we're grateful for their help and service. So then we were able to get the walls put in. Uh, there were two masons in the church that did, that did most of the work. Got the building all framed up. Eventually brought in the carpenter, who is a deacon from the Aniyama Church, and, and did a really good job on the carpentry. Uh, those, uh, someone will ask me if, uh, if you're, this church was bearing fruit or if you're raising vegetables in the church. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, those are weeds that just grew up <laughs> while the building was going on. So the kids came with their machetes and their hoes and, and cut out all the weeds. John Luke and I have services at Irfa and, and uh, at Abbe in the morning on Sundays. And then after that, we get in the Jeep and we go to the village of Donkwa for a meeting uh, at noon. There we go past the banana plantations and the, the charcoal piles. We go past the rubber plantations. And after uh, five miles, we come to the village of Donkwa, which is a place of... Uh, it's more primitive than the other villages. Uh, lots of uh, houses with, uh, uh, made out of mud and thatched roofs. The people eat very simply. Over an open fire, they cook. Uh, they go down to the creek with their, with their clothes, find their favorite rock, and uh, pound their clothes out on that rock. The cash crop in this area is cocoa. And this, these are cocoa pods. Uh, this is where you get chocolate. 35% of the world's chocolate comes from little farms like, uh, like here in, in Donkwa. Uh, they take the beans, uh, they open up the pods, take the beans out, spread them out for a week, then bag them up and send them off to, be, to, to market. We started the church here. Uh, this was our first uh, village church to start. Uh, a young man from... Uh, from, from Doqua came to the Aniyama Church and got saved and wanted us to come and minister in his village. So we had a Bible club under this mango tree. We put up a, a building, just a pole building, and we were in that for several years. We had Sunday school in this lady's kitchen, and uh, the church grew. We were eventually, in 2010, able to put in these two classroom buildings for the Sunday school classes. And we trained uh, four ladies to teach uh, the younger kids and uh, eight young men to, to, to teach the older kids in the Sunday school classes. The, the church was incorporated as, a, uh, as an independent church, although it's not completely self-supporting. Uh, and we had some 30 members sign on at that time. We were able to baptize some people this past year uh, two young men and two ladies <coughs> baptized there in the reservoir right next to Donkwa. And this past year, we were able to, uh, uh, to finish uh, the, 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 the meeting room, finish the walls, and put in doors. We have two deacons in the village church of, of Donkwa, Nibinen, who was uh, a very good, solid citizen, and uh, he, he met uh, Vivian, who was from the Abbey Church, the church I showed you before. She was helping me with the Bible Club, had a very faithful girl. And the Lord brought them to, the two together, and they were married this past year, uh, during, well, last year, during, during the COVID crisis. Uh, they were able to be married there in the, in the Donquah Church. And uh, 
left for the reception, left the reception afterwards, and they've been really a, uh, a really faithful, uh, stabilizing couple there in the village ever since. The other deacon in the, in, in the Don't Quat Church, his name is Philippe, and he has a very wonderful family. Uh, Lionel is, is, uh, is working as an engineer for a petroleum company. Uh, Blondine, who was on the left, who was baptized just recently, and their younger daughter. And Michelle, his wife, uh, teaches Sunday school. Philippe and I, in the afternoon, we get in the Jeep and we go to the village of Okongokwa, which is farther into the forest, and sometimes the road is a real challenge. We arrive at a place that's really pretty primitive. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a place that uh, they're suspicious of people. They don't, uh, they don't warm up to visitors very well at all. But the chief uh, welcomed us and uh, came to our meetings. He loaned us this building, which we used for some time. And uh, we appreciate uh, the support and help of Hubert, uh, who is the chief of the village of Okongokwa. Uh, Philippe has continued to go to, the, go to Okongokwa. He has to walk an hour through the forest in order to have a service in the afternoon, now that I'm gone. But he continues to do so. And it was in January this year that we were able to put up this building. And so that, that is now where we meet. And so we have sometimes uh, between 20 and 30 people that attend at the, the village of Okongokwa. I don't put too many pictures of myself in, the, in, the, in these presentations, but it just feels like, it seems like I need to continue pressing on. And because there's still more places to go. There's another village that we had a, we had a camp in this past summer. I don't, I don't have pictures of that but uh, in this presentation, but we need to do something there. And there were, uh, the Irfa boys uh, started a, a Bible club in another settlement, and that's a potential new church. So there's many places yet where we need to carry the gospel so that people like Lassane, who came from a Muslim family, can be saved. And uh, Arsene, whose father was a liquor seller in the village of Donkwa, his father died a terrible death uh, from an infection and bled to death in his, in his, uh, in his wife's kitchen. But Arsen has gotten saved and, and is uh, living for the Lord. And uh, Christine, who is a mother of 10, <laughs> and uh, uh, getting saved and having a Bible brought a big smile to her face. And we appreciate very much Christine, who is <laughs> oftentimes really tired but you can understand why. But uh, she loves the Lord, and she's very, very faithful to all the services. We appreciate uh, your help in, in uh, supporting these ministries and allowing us to continue uh, uh, to serve the Lord and call out a people for his name in the country of Ivory Coast. Take your hymnals one more time and turn to 654. 654 in your hymnals. Why don't you stand with me as we sing this final hymn, keep ourselves awake here. Since thou hast died to give thyself for me, no sacrifice could be too great for me to make for thee. Lord, send me anywhere, only go with me. Sustain me, sever any tie, save the tie that binds me to thy heart. Lord Jesus, my King, 
I consecrate my life, Lord, to Thee. I only have one life, and that will soon be past. I want my life to count for Christ, what's done for him will last. Lord, send me anywhere, only go with me, lay any burden on me, only sustain. tie that binds me to thy heart. Lord Jesus, my King, I consecrate my life, Lord, to thee. I follow thee, my Lord, and glory in thy cross. I gladly leave the world behind and count all gain as loss. Lord, send me anywhere, only go with me. Lay any burden on me, only sustain. that binds me to my heart. Lord Jesus, my King, I consecrate my life, Lord, to Thee. Amen. You may be seated. It's our privilege to have the Yules with us. Todd, you'll come and preach to us now, please. Thank you much, Pastor Loggins. Well, again, we've been so thankful to be here. You have all been so gracious to us, uh, meeting a lot of our needs, and we appreciate the Loggins opening their home up to us. Uh, it's nice having a place to uh, be able to stretch out some. If you've ever traveled with children, with several small children, it is a, it's nice to have a place where you don't have to you know, jump up when your child wakes up with night terrors or something because you're in a hotel and you got to keep them quiet. And it's uh, it really is a big blessing. You know, I, unless you've traveled, I don't know that you can quite understand, but it really is. Pastor Loggins is a huge blessing for us, uh, especially during the days, having a place for the kids to play. Uh, it really is a really is a very big blessing. We're going to begin in our Bibles tonight, and we're going to be turning to several passages of Scripture, but we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 22. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 22, and, and I just want to... I, at first I thought this, this message would be a question that was asked to us, but more and more as I look at this particular passage, it's more of an more of a command to us, and not, maybe not a command, but a something to encourage us. And I'd, I'd like that to be the case tonight. That this message would be something that would encourage us along a path that, we've already, that we're already traveling. And I'd like to go on, preach on this topic tonight to encourage us all, to, ex, to ex, exhort us as, a, as believers in Jesus Christ to love our God. To love our God. And as we go through this particular passage of Scripture, I'd like to share ways that I see from, from different passages of Scripture how we ought to love our God. And I do believe, as, as we close, really, and as we tie into the theme of fishers of men, if we will love our God the way He desires us to love Him, we'll be reaching the people that he wants us to reach. So let's uh, open in a word of prayer and then we'll get into the message. 
Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd be with me as I speak your words tonight. Lord, I pray that they would be your words and not my own. Help me, Lord, that your words would be an encouragement to your people here, that we'd continue in the path that I believe we are already traveling. Lord, we love you. Help us, Lord, to love you the way you'd like us to love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 22, I'd like to start, I'd like to read a couple verses, verse, beginning in verse 36. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 36. Actually, let's go back to verse 34. Uh, the background to this particular passage, you have three groups of people that are coming to Jesus, trying to trip him up in his words, trying to, it's hard to comprehend and looking at it from our point of view, looking back in history, men trying to trip up the Son of God in his, in his speech. It's humorous to think. But that's what they're trying to do. You have, first you have the Herodians, the, the come to Jesus, then the Sadducees come to Jesus, and now it's the Pharisees or the lawyers coming to Jesus trying to trip him up in his words. Beginning in verse 34, we see, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. It's interesting, as you, as you look at that particular passage of Scripture, I don't know exactly how the lawyer felt at that time that came to Jesus. But throughout the, the, the first two uh, uh, meetings that Jesus had with the Herodians, with the Sadducees, they were just astounded at how he, how he was able to speak so clearly and not offend anyone, not offend the, the, he didn't offend Caesar, he didn't offend the other people, he, he, didn't put, he didn't divide between people, he just spoke the truth. And they were amazed at that. And when, I think what's so astonishing with what Jesus says, is if you turn, take your Bible and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. Because this is where Jesus takes this passage from. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 is called, in, in Hebrew, it's called the Shema. It is one, it is one of the first uh, passages of Scripture that any Jewish boy or girl would learn as they're coming up, as they come of age. They would learn this particular thing. And I think it's astonishing that Jesus takes and uses something that this lawyer probably knew from, he could probably quote it. But yet it's something he had not taken into his heart. Yes, he knew the law inside and out, but he didn't personalize this. And when we read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, the Bible says here, in verse number 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord with all thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. It's interesting because... These Pharisees were also the group of people that just a couple verses down in, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8, they took so literally. In chapter 6, verse 8, they say, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hands, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. The lawyers, the Pharisees of this time, would have what were called phylacteries, that they would actually tie boxes with Scripture to their head. They took this so literally that they would, they would put these Scripture here to show how, how wise and how loyal they were to Christ. But what, what they were showing on the outward was not in their heart. And I think as we go through our lives as believers, that's probably the biggest thing that we need to avoid. Because we can come to church and we can say, oh, I love, I love Jesus. I love the Lord. I'm, I've, I've, got all the, I've got all the things right on the outside. But is it in our heart? Have we internalized it? Is that a part of who we are? And so as we look at this topic of loving our God, I have four points that I'd like to share with us. And the first is that our love for God must be supreme. Our love for God must be supreme. And as each one of these points, I want to look at a specific passage of Scripture and show 
an example of how our love for God ought to be in our lives. How we can internalize this. And once we internalize our love for Christ, we don't have to put on a show because it comes out naturally. So first thing I see, our love for God must be supreme. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 22. I want to look at a, a passage there. Genesis chapter 22. And I think words are important. As we, uh, in the day and age that we live in, it seems like our vocabularies become smaller and smaller and words take on meanings that aren't necessarily what we thought. I, just as I was studying through, I have Webster's 1828 Dictionary on my, on my computer. And if you look at Webster's 1828 Dictionary, you look at a definition to, for a word, and you look at the Merriam-Webster Dictionary and you look at the same word, the definition sometimes don't overlap, or in Webster's 1828, you have to have your dictionary to look up the words they define the word with. And when you go through all those words and you look up all those definitions, the word takes on such a depth in meaning. And I think that's a beautiful point here. And so when I say our love for God must be supreme, that word supreme means highest in degree or quality. Something that you have put above everything else. And when I think of Genesis chapter 20, 22, beginning in verse number 1, I, and we look at uh, uh, Abraham and Isaac here, I don't want to read the whole passage. I don't want to take the time to, hold, to read the whole passage. But it comes, if you look at your Bible, I'll, I'll, narrate, I'll narrate the story. In Genesis chapter 22, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible, the Bible says that God came to Abraham. And he comes to Abraham in a dream and he says, Abraham? And Abraham says, Lord, here am I. And, Ab and God says, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. The son that I have promised you, Isaac being the son of promise, fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant, take that son and take him to the land of Moriah, a, to a mountain that I will show you, and offer him there as a burnt offering unto me. I think as I read this story more and more, as a father, it takes on much more meaning. I have three daughters. And I wouldn't want to offer any of them as an offering to the Lord, a burnt offering. But Abraham was willing to take the one son that was promised to him by God. The one son, and according to this passage of Scripture, he takes him early in the morning. He takes the fire, the wood, loads it on a donkey, and travels three days to the land of Moriah. And offers, takes his son up to the mountain, lays the, builds the altar, lays the wood in order, puts his son upon the altar, raises the knife to slay his son in obedience in his love for the Lord and is willing to slay his only son. If that is not an example of supreme love for God, I don't know another example in, this, in the Bible other than that of God sending his own son, Jesus Christ, to the cross for us. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were unlovely, while we were worth nothing, God sent His Son to die on our, be for, on our behalf to take the payment of our sin. I see that God, not only does, would, would, should our love be supreme, but He deserves supreme love for that one act that He did for us by sending His own Son. John, uh, 1 John 4 verse 19 says, We love Him because He first loved us. Not only does God deserve supreme love, He demonstrated supreme love on the cross. And in Exodus chapter 20, when He gave the law to the nation of Israel, He demanded supreme love. He said in verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before Me. Our love for God must be supreme. Second thing I'd like to see, that our love for God should be passionate. Our love for God must be passionate. I'd like to look at a man 
named Josiah for this in 2 Kings chapter 23. 2 Kings 23, and again, we won't read the entire passage because it's 25 verses. But that word passionate has the idea of having or showing, expressing strong emotions or belief with great intensity. I enjoy hunting. And uh, it, it's something fun. I, I, I really do enjoy it. I enjoy getting to take my daughter out hunting. Uh, last year, she was in the tree stand when, with, I call it her first deer, because she was in the tree stand with me. And it's wonderful. I, I love getting to share that. But how many of you enjoy hearing good hunting stories, right? I love hearing good hunting stories. It's, it's, it's so much fun. Fishermen are probably even worse uh, with their hunting stories. <clears throat> and I am not a good fisherman. I am probably, I'm, I'm still a liar, but I'm not a good fisherman. I don't catch fish well. But you know, when people tell stories, is it fun to listen to a story that they're telling you everything that's taking place? That they're, they're man, I was, I was sneaking up on this deer and he smelled me and I got down and he was looking for me and I started crawling on my hands and knees and I forgot I left my gun behind because I was so intense. So I, rather than going back for my gun, I pulled out my hunting knife and I just got him with my knife. You know, that's, that's a fun story. But, you know, when someone else is telling a story, yeah, well... <clears throat> I got up at four o'clock in the morning and, you know, we drove out to the stand. And I walked up on one and, and just, you know, I, I pulled up and shot him. There's a complete difference in those stories. Someone has got a lot of passion in their story and the other guy seems like he couldn't care less. But when we look at Josiah here in 2 Kings chapter 23, and I'm not there, so we'll get there. But in 2 Kings 23, we see a man with passion. And it all stems from the reading of the Word of God. 2 Kings 23, verse number 1, we see that as Josiah becomes king, remember, he became king as an 8-year-old boy. As he becomes king and he begins preparing to uh, repair the temple of God, that a book of the law is found. Probably the book of Deuteronomy. Maybe the book of Deuteronomy, but one of, the, one of the books of the law. And in verse number 1 says, And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him. And the priests and the prophets, small and great, and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. The book of this, this book of the covenant that was found in the temple of, of God as it was being restored and repaired by this king is so touched the heart of Josiah that he had to share it with everybody else. And later on in verse, verse 2 and 3, we see that he is, he begins, he brings this covenant before the people and they all ascend and they stand and they accept this covenant that God has. And immediately then, they begin cleaning the house. In verse number 4, we see that the temple is purified. The temple is purified by taking out all the things that had defiled it. He cleans out the temple. Then verse number 5, he removes all the false priests, all the pagan priests. He throws them out of the city, completely tears down their groves. In verse number 5, we see that and he, dis uh, he destroys houses, uh, immoral houses, in verse number um, 5 and 6. Burning groves. Later on in the passage, in verse, uh, later on in uh, between verse 1 and 25, I didn't write it down, but it's in there if you want to read it. <clears throat> read that passage. It's a good passage. But he literally takes the sepulchers of the old prophets that have died, burns their bones upon the altar, and then cast them into the river. If that guy didn't have passion, I don't know who did. When he, when he read what God said about, about not having any other gods before them, about, about how God was a jealous God, and how He wanted those to love Him, 
He took that to his, he took that personally. And he made it his personal goal to cleanse the nation of Israel of their idolatrous. Now, we are not going to go out and burn pagan altars down in our day and age. That was for Josiah at that time. But God's given us a job to do. Ought we not be passionate about what we do? When we tell someone about Jesus Christ, are we, are we the, the second story here that has no emotion about what God has done for us? Or are we, are, are we passionate in showing them, look, God changed my life. He, he took me from on my way to hell, and now I'm on my way to heaven, which I didn't deserve. Amen. And He's done it for you too. We ought to be passionate about that story. If the Gospel is not enthralling and and wonderful to us. We need to get in His book because that's where we'll get our passion back. It's where Josiah found it and I think that's where we need to find it in this day and age as well. Not only must our love for God must be supreme, passionate, I see it also, must be willing. Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24, we are at the end of the life of Joshua. And he stands before the nation of Israel and he gives them a choice. Joshua chapter 24, beginning of verse 1, he says, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and he called for their elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. And throughout that passage, down through verse 16, we see Joshua relating the history of the nation of Israel from the time of Abraham coming out of Egypt, going into Egypt, going into Egypt, then coming out of Egypt from bondage, how God has led them across the Red Sea in conquering all these, uh, these pagan lands and these pagan kings, showing them the superiority of God. But at the end, in verse 16, Joshua gives them a choice. He says, in verse 15, he says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers the serve that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. He gave them a choice. And love for God is a choice that we have to make. The word willing means to be prompt to act or respond. It means to be ready. Our love for God... <clears throat> must be willing. We must be ready at every moment to give that. Because God did not make us robots the moment we got saved. God is not glorified by people just loving Him because they're forced to. God gives each and every one of us a choice. And it, is a, it, it gives God glory when sinful people make a choice of their own will to love Him, to choose to serve Him. He is glorified by that and only that. He is glorified by a, a willing heart of willing love. One of my favorite, one of my favorite stories of a willing, uh, a willing, a choice to bind yourself to another it takes place in Exodus. You don't have to turn there. It's part of the law that God is giving. Exodus 21, and I'll read verse number 5. It says, and if, there, and if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. This, the context behind that is when an indentured servant becomes freed from his bond. He has, a, he has a wife, a family there in the master's house. But it, it's, he says, I love my master. I love my wife. I love my children. I will not go out free. The Bible says that the elders of the city are to take that man 
to the post of the door, drive it all through his ear and put a ring showing that he has willingly bound himself to the authority of another. We as believers ought to willingly bind ourselves under the authority of Jesus Christ. When Joshua stood before these people, at that point he said they need to make a choice. But I wish it was that easy. I wish they could have, you know, as we see from the nation of Israel, at that moment they chose to love God. They chose to serve Him. But what do we see as soon as Joshua is off the scene? They fall into idolatry. They fall into all kinds of sin. And isn't that so true of the Christian life? The moment we're saved, we have a zeal, we have a desire to serve the Lord, but it seems like as soon as we, as soon as we leave church, something comes in and our zeal and our love for God fades. That willing choice why, our love, why, why we must, our love for God must be willing is because our choices have to be continuously made on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Because our, we can't just make a decision one time and say, yes, I'm going to love God, I'm going to serve Him. Because it doesn't happen that way. We don't stay dedicated to Him. We have to, we have to on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, when sin comes up, when choices come, when, when temptations come, we have to turn from that and say, no, Lord, I am committed to You. I want to love You. I want to serve You. So not only do I see our love for God must be supreme, it must be passionate, it must be willing, Lastly, I see that our love for God, when those three things are true in our lives, if we will love our God uh, supremely, passionately, and willingly, I see that our love for God will be evident. When those three things take place in our lives, it's going to be evident to those around us. The word evident means an external display that's so evident that little or no inference is required. When we read the story of Abraham, and we saw what he did, he made that choice within himself. He didn't share it with anyone else, that he was going to love God supremely. But yet, if you looked, if you go back, all those centuries, and you ask the people in that area, you ask the people of Jabus and in the land of Moriah that would later become Jerusalem, you ask them, did Abraham love his God? Did they have to hear from Abraham and say, did they have to hear Abraham say, oh, I love God, I love my God? They saw what he did. And they saw that he loved his God. They maybe didn't understand it, but they could tell he loved his God. When we look at the life of Josiah, did you have to ask the priests that he kicked out of the temple if he loved his God? Did you have to ask the people in Jerusalem when he called them up, hey, hey, did, uh, did Josiah love his God? I'm pretty sure everybody knew. Probably when he dug up the graves of the false prophets. I think by that point, I would, I would probably, I'd probably think, yeah, this guy's maybe a little fanatical. But he loved his God. And he was obedient to his God. The nation of Israel, when Joshua came to them and he offered them a question, you choose. You choose. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Probably before he got to the, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. They're thinking, I know where Joshua stands. We watched what he did. We watched how he led us. We watched how he led us in the conquest of the, of the land of, of, of Israel. If we will love our God in that way, we don't have to go around telling people that we love him. We're going to tell people that he loves them, but we don't have to tell them that we love him. It was funny, I was at a church service, and it was a pretty large church, <clears throat> and the, the pastor that was preaching was 
giving a message about something about loving God and, and all these things. And there was a man in the, in the congregation. I felt bad for him because he, after, when the pastor said something, he shouted, I love Jesus. And the pastor said, if you have to tell people that you love Jesus, you don't love him. I felt bad for that guy. I'm glad it wasn't me. But it's so true. John 14, verse 15 says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. 14, verse 23, John 14, verse 23 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If man will love, love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And he will come unto me, and he will come unto him and make our abode with him. When I think of examples of this, I think of John 21, and you can turn there. I'd like to close with this. John chapter 21. If you know we're going in our Bibles, it's after the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus meets His disciples on the Sea of Galilee. In John chapter 21, verse 15. It says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. And you can continue down through that passage and you see, I don't doubt Peter's love for Jesus. I don't think, I'm not even sure that Jesus... Necessarily, Jesus was doubting Peter's love for him. But something had happened in Peter's life. One of these things had fallen out. Peter was not necessarily loving Jesus supremely at that point in his life. He had put something else there. I think Jesus was trying to prick Peter's heart and saying, there's something there, Peter. You've walked away from me. I don't doubt anyone's sincerity. And I, I'm learning as we travel and we meet different people in different places, I don't doubt people's sincerity when they say, I don't doubt their love for Jesus. But I often wonder, is there something, is there something that's missing that we need to be loving Him more? Loving Him better. Loving Him in one of these ways, supremely, passionately, or willingly. You know, sometimes you see people who you know, love Him very passionately, <laughs> when they're in a crowd, but maybe not in private. Maybe they made a choice at one time in their life, but they've kind of drifted away, like Peter has. No doubt, no doubt, Peter has, loves the Lord. I don't think there's any way you can doubt that in the, in the Gospels. Peter loves the Lord. But maybe he's gotten away from it in some way or another. And that's how I want to challenge us tonight. Is there something... Is there some way that we've walked away from our God? Walked away from the love? Remember Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. That first particular passage that, that, that says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That's the way God wants us to love Him. Though we're not in the Old Testament... That love hasn't changed. We still ought to be devoted to Him. So I question, are we loving God supremely? Are we loving Him passionately? Are we making willing choices to love Him on a moment-by-moment -moment basis? When those are true, our love for God will be evident to those around us. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank You so much for Your Word. Father, thank You for loving us. Father, as believers here tonight, would You help each and every one of us to love You in, these, in this way. Father, this is what You want. I, I'm convinced of that. This is how You want us to live. Not as missionaries, Lord, but as believers so we can reach those around us. Thank You, Lord, for this time in Your Word. We pray these things in your name. Amen.
Great challenge tonight, isn't it? Let's stand to our feet, our heads bowed and eyes closed.